And good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, joined by uh, Lieutenant General, uh, General JJ Fruin, uh, the head of uh, Operation COVID Shield, the Chief Medical Officer, uh, Professor Paul Kelly, uh, and obviously uh, Professor Brendan Murphy, the Secretary of the Department and the head of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Group. So um, uh, we've received updated uh, medical advice from the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation and wish to address that this afternoon. And uh, one of the things that we have done throughout the course of the pandemic, from the earliest days when Brendan provided his advice, is follow that medical advice. It has been the difference in so many ways as to why this year, for example, whilst the world has agonisingly lost over two million souls to COVID, there have been no people who have caught COVID in Australia and passed away. We'll continue to follow that medical advice. And today, uh, the advice we've received from uh, ATAGI uh, is uh, after reviewing the latest evidence, and uh, Paul Kelly and Brendan will uh, provide more detail on, on this, uh, they, have uh, they have recommended an increase in the age range for those who uh, should be using AstraZeneca from 50 to 60 and above. Uh, and they have therefore recommended that Pfizer is the preferred vaccine for under 60s. Uh, they have uh, strongly recommended that second doses be uh, completed for all of those who have had uh, AstraZeneca who are under 60 years of age, and that I think includes JJ at the current moment, and uh, I've uh, had, along with Brendan, both of our doses. Um, in particular, uh, we recognise that this uh, is a conservative position, but relative to Australia's uh, risk of having COVID. Uh, the United Kingdom, for example, has an age range of 40 and above for AstraZeneca. Uh, South Korea, 30 and above for AstraZeneca. And uh, uh, Germany has no age limits on AstraZeneca for uh, uh, the general product uh, for 18 and above. Um, our response, um, is really fourfold. Uh, firstly, we accept the advice and uh, uh, accept uh, that uh, Pfizer is the preferred vaccine for under 60s and AstraZeneca is recommended for over 60s. That continues to be strong, clear advice. Secondly, uh, we will move uh, to open access to Pfizer uh, immediately for 40 to 59 year olds uh, and that this uh, uh, will open for approximately 2.1 million people who are in that 40, uh, uh, in that 50 to 59 group uh, who have not yet received vaccinations. Um, that move uh, will be accompanied by work which uh, Lieutenant General Fruin or JJ is overseeing um, to increase the points of presence or access. So at the moment, um, Pfizer is available through uh, some Commonwealth clinics and state clinics and over the course of July, um, JJ will oversee uh, the rollout to Pfizer of up to 1,300 general practices around the country. And as the rest of the year continues, uh, that will be expanded. Uh, Commonwealth vaccination clinics uh, between now and the end of July will expand to 136 that will be providing Pfizer for the 40 to 49 groups. And uh, the uh, and so I think that that's a very important thing and states and territories will make their own decisions as to their capacity and availability to do that at a time that uh, best suits their abilities. Uh, the other thing is, I should note that in terms of supply, um, but in the uh, first three months of the rollout from February to May, we received 3.4 million uh, doses of, uh, of Pfizer. Uh, this month we're expected to receive 1.7 million and next month that will grow to 2.8 million doses uh, and that's what will allow us to expand uh, the coverage. Um, and then over the balance of the year, and I've had this reaffirmed by the country head of Pfizer today, uh, we'll receive the remaining 32.5 million doses. So that means that we remain on track uh, to receive all of our Pfizer during the course of this year. Uh, approximately 25.5% of uh, the total population uh, that's eligible for vaccination in Australia has now been vaccinated, and uh, that includes 64% um, uh, of the over 70s and 46% of, of people 50, uh, uh, 50 and above. I, I would note, uh, what does this mean uh, to the two central questions? 
Uh, are we on track to uh, offer every Australian a vaccine uh, who, who is eligible during the course of 2021? The answer remains and the advice we have is yes. Um, and then secondly, uh, what we also note uh, is that for those who are in the 50 to 59 group, it is a change and we recognise that uh, that uh, does bring some challenges. Uh, they will now have access to Pfizer. They do need, um, and we ask for their patience whilst the general practices are rolled out and whilst the Commonwealth vaccination clinic clinics are rolled out. Um, but we will have significant volumes of Pfizer coming in uh, over the course of uh, the coming weeks and, uh, and months. Uh, but we do ask for people's patience on that front. Uh, I'd note that the total vaccines are now well over 6.2 million. The first four million, as we've said honestly, that took uh, longer than expected because of the first change to AstraZeneca and the international supplies. The last two million have been significantly faster than we expected. So uh, all these things come together, but at this stage, 6.2 million uh, vaccines have been delivered in Australia and about 25.5% of the eligible population has received the, uh, the vaccines. I'll turn to Paul to um, outline the Atagi decision. Brendan briefly, and then uh, JJ will talk about the uh, approach to the rollout going forwards. Um, thanks, Minister. So um, within the last half an hour, the, the Otagi advice has uh, arrived with the, with the Minister. There are an advisory group to the Federal Minister for Health, and that advice has been given uh, just, uh, just before we arrived here. Um, it's it, the as as you know we have had uh, the the Atagi group has been meeting every week uh, reviewing all of the information that comes through the TGA and other mechanisms uh, about any adverse events related to uh, vaccines uh, and their advice has 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 been based on the S50 and 59 uh, so that has changed the the rate uh, of that of that particular issue in that age group. Uh, to the point where the rate is very similar to the under 50s. And so it's really, uh, that's been the key new information that has been, uh, that has gone to uh, ATAGI and they've based that on the, on the risk benefit equation now being uh, the risk out, outweighing the benefit in that particular age group. Uh, in the statement that they've given and will be published shortly, um, they go through that in some detail about, about why, why they've made that uh, decision. They've balanced the risk and benefit of the, of the vaccine in the context where we are right now in Australia in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and also with an eye to what might happen over the coming months. And I think that's a really important message. AstraZeneca remains a very effective vaccine. The benefit of AstraZeneca in the over 60s remains uh, much higher than the risk of this particularly rare but sometimes serious syndrome. Uh, and so people over 60 should still be rolling up to their GP or wherever they are getting their AstraZeneca vaccine uh, and get that first dose. The second important component of the, of the advice is that anyone who has had a first dose of AstraZeneca without problem uh, should feel very confident to have their second dose uh, and they should keep that booking. Uh, go and talk to your GP about it if you're concerned, but on the basis of, uh, of information we have in Australia, we've not had a single case of this particular syndrome in a second dose, but we have not had many second doses. Uh, in Australia, but in the UK, they've had almost 16 million doses of second doses of AstraZeneca. And the rate of this particular rare but sometimes serious condition uh, is much, much lower, um, around 1.5 per million, uh, which is way lower than the first dose um, uh, in, that's across all age groups. Um, so that's the, the first point is we've changed the, data, the changed the information. The information has changed. The medical advice has changed. We've taken the medical advice. Um, for those aged uh, between 40 and, and 59, now Pfizer will be made available. For people over 60, uh, should not hesitate and get that get that uh, uh, that dose of AstraZeneca. Uh, if you've had the first dose, make sure you get your second dose. My father had AstraZeneca last week, and I'll be advising him to go ahead and get that second dose. Uh, as other relatives and friends of mine, I'll be making that advice in that age group. Um, for those who may have had AstraZeneca uh, in the past month who are in that age group, 50 to 59, I can imagine that this news could uh, cause concern. Remember, this remains a very rare but sometimes serious uh, event. We're picking it up much more commonly than other, other countries because we're looking uh, more fully. Uh, we've got good diagnostic 
uh, algorithms and very good treatment uh, modalities and understanding in the clinical community about the, the correct treatment which has been given properly and our results um, really reflect that so that we have 55% uh, of, of those 60 cases now um, have left hospital already. Uh, some uh, remain in hospital and some are in ICU. We've had unfortunately and very tragically those two deaths uh, in that group. But for most people, uh, they've been diagnosed early. Uh, there is a large proportion of those with a less severe form of this, of this rare syndrome, uh, and most of those have been discharged from hospital already. Uh, I think I'll leave it there, uh, Minister. Professor Murphy. Thanks, Minister. So as it was last time when we made a recommendation, we're doing so this time on the basis of a highly precautionary approach given our good epidemiological situation in Australia. And based on the best medical advice, there is now, it's interesting that this, the, this incidence of this condition in this age group is higher than we've seen in the UK data, which we used to base our original statement on, but we always stick with our Australian data. We think we are picking up more cases of this condition than just about anyone in the world because our doctors are so good and picking up the large number of people who have actually very mild conditions, particularly those in the older age group. So I've got two basic messages to those 3.8 million Australians who have had a first dose of AstraZeneca, go and get your second dose, however old you are. As Paul said, the, we have had no cases of this condition in the people who've had second doses in Australia and even in the UK, which has had the biggest experience. It's a very, very, very rare incidence of probable cases that they've seen. So it's a completely different picture for second doses. And there's, I would strongly encourage everyone to get that full protection. You need the two doses of your vaccines to be protected. The other message is that for those over 60, and particularly those over 70 who have more than a one in 10 chance of dying from COVID if they get COVID. We are seeing little outbreaks of COVID in Australia as we always said we would. You need to be protected as soon as possible. If you're, if you're over 60 and particularly the older you get, the more important it is, go and get vaccinated first and second doses at your GP with AstraZeneca. It is a highly, highly effective vaccine. I've had two doses, I feel really protected now. So I just encourage those older Australians to turn up and get vaccinated. 64% of the over 70s have now been vaccinated with first doses and we want the rest of those who haven't had a first dose yet to turn up and get vaccinated like I've done, like the Minister's done. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Lieutenant General. Thank you, Minister. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the PM has asked me to come and take uh, direct control of the rollout and all of the resources and assets involved in the rollout. Uh, this, of course, is building on the fabulous work that has already been done by many, including Brendan Murphy, Paul Kelly, uh, Carolyn Edwards, many colleagues at the Department of Health and the whole Vaccine Task Force. But this is a, a new phase now. The Minister's mentioned this new phase will be known as Operation COVID Shield. Uh, and I am uh, given the aim of ensuring as many Australians as possible get vaccinated as quickly as possible within the available resources. Uh, and that's what I intend to do. I am presently conducting a comprehensive review of the program uh, to date, uh, and I will be looking for any opportunity to optimise the current plans to accelerate the rollout where we can as additional uh, supplies come online. We will, of course, be encouraging all Australians to get vaccinated as quickly as possible, and uh, we will be continuing with the, uh, the safe and efficient rollout of vaccines as we go. Now, specifically to ATAGI's advice today, uh, the Minister has touched on one aspect of how we will be making uh, immediate adjustments to the plan. Uh, we will be uh, fast-tracking uh, the onboarding of GPs to deliver COVID, and we'll have uh, 1,300 GPs able to do that by the end of July. Uh, we already have uh, 20, 21 Commonwealth vaccination clinics that can administer Pfizer. Uh, there will be 70 of those by the first week in the first week of July, and we aim to have all 136 Pfizer capable uh, by the end of July. We're also working with the states and territories uh, and helping them to uh, uh, administer Pfizer through their various clinics um, as quickly as we can also. 
The, uh, we also want to make sure that this new cohort of people know how they can get the vaccine and where they can get the vaccine. And again, in partnership with the states and territories, we will be making adjustments to the eligibility checker and to the booking systems to allow a rapid facilitation of that. Uh, and we aim to have that up and running in the next few days. Uh, and when it comes to supply, this is a, an adjustment to the program with the current uh, uh, available supplies of Pfizer, we can make these adjustments and I am confident that we will still meet the primary aim of giving every Australian who wants a vaccine access to a vaccine uh, by the end of this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister, you said that this was a highly, well I think it might have been Brendan Murphy actually, highly um, cautious uh, bit of advice from a target. Isn't it absolutely disastrous to the rollout? And if you could answer that one, but to, I'll put to the medics, how many other uh, pharmaceuticals uh, do you and other doctors have regularly um, prescribed that have a greater than two in four million chance of, of uh, death? So uh, in terms of the rollout, uh, no, it's a challenge. Every day, every day during COVID, the world has challenges. Australia's challenges, thankfully and mercifully, have been different to the rest of the world. Um, just that point that I made at the outset of over 2 million lives lost worldwide officially and on the World Health Organization's figures potentially 5 million when you take into account the, uh, those that haven't been recorded and zero lives lost uh, to anybody who's caught COVID in Australia this year. So that's, that's the grand perspective on all of this. So in terms of the rollout, uh, what it means is it lifts from the age of uh, 50 to the age of 60, those that get AstraZeneca, and it lifts from the age of 49 to 59, those that get Pfizer. So we're adapting immediately and we're able to do that. Uh, on, on the two in four million, which I think is now uh, what we've seen, two fatalities out of four million shots. Uh, yes, it's very, very rare. Uh, and those that risk and benefit equation, we've asked the, the, uh, the experts to look at that. They've looked at that in the context of the epidemiology here in Australia, thinking ahead about what the epidemiology might be in terms of that benefit element. Uh, and that's the decision they've made. Just in vaccines, I would say that is actually a, a rel that is a high rate. Um, so that is important. Just on the epidemiology, is it, are we taking into account as well the fact that you are now prescribing lockdowns for large parts of the community as part of the cure for this disease? Does that come into their consideration? In fact, that it's not just against a case number of zero, mm. it's against the alternative medications which you are prescribing on large populations. Is it taken into account? Part of a target's role is to balance, and Brendan's probably better placed uh, than me to answer this, but part of a target's role is to balance the, uh, the risks and benefits, and the risks are all of those elements that a society faces in terms of COVID. Mm. The time it's taking us. Yeah, I, th I don't think the Commonwealth has prescribed too many lockdowns. Um, we have certainly... Well, in the outcomes, so we we do have uh, we have seen a number of lockdowns, and I think that is part of the risk benefit. If we didn't have uh, low community transmission, increasing access to mRNA vaccines, including Pfizer and Moderna, in coming months, and uh, the situation we're in now, there might have, the the risk benefit might have been different. If we had widespread community transmission of some thousands of cases, uh, the risk benefit would probably be in favour of sticking with the current recommendation. But in that, I think it's also important to remember that there are a number of people in that 50 to 59 year old age group who have been very hesitant and were probably not going to turn up for AstraZeneca, no matter how much we reassured them. This now gives some of those 2.1 million people an opportunity to get vaccinated earlier. So it's just a balance of those risks. And I can tell you that that expert panel of medical experts and consumers and others had spent about 24 hours agonising over all these issues. Professor Murphy, Murphy, what's the situation with hesitancy at the moment, as far as you can tell? I'd love to hear from the general as well, given your carriage of this. How serious is hesitancy within the community? And are you worried this will damage that, that mood there now? Let me just start uh, on the, the latest figures. The latest figures are that, that we've seen uh, at least 70% of Australians intending to have a vaccine. Um, and then there's uh, you know, another group that we want to really work hard to convert. We want to get every 
possible Australian to be vaccinated. Uh, but the, uh, the latest figures of the tracking research that we've done have shown 70% with a positive clear intention. Uh, that's actually increased. Um, and what we are seeing, of course, is that uh, Australians have been coming out in very large numbers. The most important thing for us to do is if we do have the medical advice, uh, to follow it. And that's the difference between what's occurred in Australia and so many other countries. We've acted swiftly. We've always had contingencies. So today we put in place the contingency uh, where we lift the age for AstraZeneca, uh, but we lift the age uh, for access to Pfizer. And uh, there was a point when we were going to be doing that in any event. We're doing it now, perhaps a few weeks earlier than we otherwise might have. Sorry, Brendan. No, I think I'm just saying the same thing, that hesitancy is still quite low in Australia. Um, we know that over 70 per cent of people are intending to get vaccinated. Uh, of course, uh, there are impacts on hesitancy. This may have some impact, but the publication by the TGA in our transparent way of the new data could have impact on hesitancy as well. We believe that the community is more likely to do as we recommend if we are absolutely transparent and follow the medical advice at all times. So we'll go, hang on, I'll go, uh, uh, Rachel, Tom, Mark, here, and then David. Minister, can people get a Pfizer dose as their second dose instead of AstraZeneca if they are really concerned about, you know, some of those side effects? And secondly, we, you've said that we're doing really well at catching these cases of um, TTS, but there have been instances where it's been 52 days since the vaccine where someone has actually been diagnosed. Is, is there a risk that we're not communicating those symptoms enough to people and they're underplaying their, their risk? So I'll go the, the, to the second one first. Um, so the, there is there is a range of, of time between when the uh, vaccine is given and the and the um, the syndrome um, is diagnosed. Uh, that's mostly about when it actually comes on. So there is a range of, of time between the dose and the start of the symptoms. Uh, so uh, I've written. I will be writing again today to all medical practitioners, reminding them about the importance of watching and wait and and what they need to do, where they need to go to get the most. Uh, up-to-date advice. Yeah, and there is. So my dad again, because he wants me to mention him on a press conference, so <laughs> I've finally done it. Um, but he, uh, he he showed me the, the what he would had received when he went to get his first AstraZeneca dose, and it very clearly states all of those things, what to watch out for, the fact that this could be serious, uh, make sure you contact uh, back to the place where you've got that dose. So so that's all there. We're, we're looking to see whether we need to strengthen some of that advice. Certainly we need to change the, some of the age range and so forth with our advice. Um, and the, the first question, sorry, was... The first question was, you know, you're obviously recommending AstraZeneca for a second dose when they've already had it, but yeah. can they get Pfizer instead of they really Yeah. So, so we've got now millions, tens of millions of, of, of uh, cases of people having the same dose of both facts, uh, the same vaccine twice, uh, AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Pfizer, Moderna, Moderna, whatever it is. That's where all the information comes from the clinical trials and the real world evidence of effectiveness and safety. Uh, with, there are some trials looking at, at a mix and match approach and some countries have gone down that path, but there is very little evidence that it's either effective or safe. And in fact, some of the, of the uh, evidence we have so far is you actually get more of that immunogenic um, uh, you know, short, short-lived symptoms in the first 24 hours if you do AstraZeneca Pfizer. Oh. Minister Victoria is among states saying that Pfizer supplies are already under pressure. Won't this exacerbate that? What confidence do you have that the numbers that you've given us will be reflected as the year goes on? Sure. So I'll speak first and then invite JJ. Um, so in terms of Victoria, for example, uh, we've been able to provide approximately 380,000 during the course of June. Uh, the total Victorian number will increase over July to about 560,000. That's another 380,000 to the government um, and 180,000 to general practice. Uh, more generally, uh, Pfizer has been a remarkably reliable partner. Um, they have never overpromised, and they have always delivered on time. Uh, and obviously they've indicated that the, uh, the numbers that we can expect uh, over the course of the next six weeks are about 3.4 million. And of that, uh, 2.8 million will be in uh, July, which was higher than we had previously indicated. General? So last time ATAGI made a recommendation like this, it took in almost half the population. This time the cohort affects about 2.1 million people. We have 
2.3 million doses of Pfizer readily at hand. By the end of July, we will have an additional 3.4 million doses of Pfizer at hand. So from a logistics perspective, this is a relatively minor adjustment for us. Of course, there will be a couple of weeks of adjustment of just getting that cohort organised and perhaps uh, switching over to Pfizer, but we can well accommodate this, uh, this adjustment. Thanks. Mark, Mark, just trying to make sense of the advice today that's necessitated this very sudden decision. From what Professor Kelly said, there were 12 cases advised from the TGA to ATAGI. Uh, five of them were, oh, well, seven were between the ages of 50 and 59, seeing that it's AstraZeneca. The other five must have been aged 60 and over. So if that number was six, would you be banning this altogether? Why is it, there's only two difference? Why is it such an extreme uh, position now that it has to be advised against for one cohort? Yet two less for people over 60, and you're saying go ahead, happy days, and take it. Look, I'll make one brief comment and then turn on the medical advice to uh, to Paul and to Brendan. Uh, one of the critical things is the principle of following that medical advice, and I respect the fact that there are many people with differing views, as there have been since day one. There were many people who thought that the decision to close the uh, close the borders with China was a precipitant decision. Um, there are other countries um, now that have uh, a, a far more forward-leaning use of AstraZeneca, over 40 uh, in the UK, over 30 in South Korea, no age limits uh, within the, uh, the prescribed range in Germany whatsoever. Uh, and so they have taken a cautious decision, but based on the uh, Australian risk and benefit. And that risk and benefit changes with age. Uh, the risk uh, of, uh, uh, of death by COVID goes up as you get older. Uh, the risk in terms of the impact of this condition, as well as the incidence, decreases as you get older. Paul? Uh, yeah, the, so the minister summarised that that's the, that's the, the, the essential difference. Um, so at, at the age of 50 to 59, that benefit is less than old, the older people uh, of being vaccinated. Um, the numbers I mentioned was just this week's numbers, so to put that in context of a overall um, a rate per 100,000. So um, under 50, it's 3.1 per 100,000 doses uh, getting this TTS syndrome, recognising that those younger people are getting the more severe forms of that, the older less. 50 to 59 has jumped up now to 2.7. So it's very similar to that under 50. It drops down again to 1.4 when you get to 60 to 69 uh, and so on. So, so that's the answer. Uh, it's about the rates. It did change a lot in the last so week. 2.7 is the threshold. If it reaches that for people over 60, you'll ban this thing. No, it's always a risk-benefit equation, as we've said all along. So the benefit of over 60s, and um, uh, Brendan mentioned earlier about the about the rate of death, um, but also the rates of ICU and uh, hospitalisation, severe COVID, rapidly increases over the age of 60. So I'll so take th three more questions. Yes. Just a question on supply. I just want to clarify: Are you going to consider bringing forward any of those supplies from Pfizer? You said that they're on track to get. Uh, so I have spoken with the country head of Pfizer uh, again today and uh, reaffirmed that, in fact, uh, as uh, the general and uh, myself have set out, we'll have uh, access to 2.8 million doses during the course of July, which was uh, in excess of what we'd previously indicated. Um, so that's, that's positive. Um, well, we were previously expecting 600,000 a week. It's been increased to 2.8. Uh, um, and in addition, we've also requested that anything which can be brought forward should be brought forward. Um, now, it is, a, it is a difficult, challenging global situation. Uh, we have 40 million doses that are secured, uh, which we believe are reliable and which will be delivered, as well as uh, we have high faith in the uh, timing and reliability of Moderna arriving during the course of this year. So that's an extra 50 million uh, all up. Um, that uh, we can rely on, uh, minus those that have already uh, arrived. Just to confirm on that, so you've got 2.1 million people from 50 to 59 who can't get AstraZeneca or need something else. So surely you need 4 million additional doses of Pfizer for that cohort. Are you saying that you've got any extra Pfizer coming? We, we already had whole of population coverage, so we already had 40 million Pfizer uh, which had been booked in, plus 10 million Moderna. So that's uh, 50 million uh, doses between those, uh, between those two. 
plus the AstraZeneca, knowing that at this point in time, um, uh, over 6.2 million vaccinations have already been delivered in Australia. Oh, given, so, given the fact that people are going to be more scared by this news and confused about what to do, will you commit, as doctors have been asking for, for a new and entirely different approach to public education on getting vaccinated? And what will that look like? Well, we, uh, we are moving to uh, a next phase of the, uh, the vaccination campaign. I think uh, uh, we will be moving to a focus on uh, you know, the, uh, the groups now between uh, 40 and 59, um, as well as continuing to encourage. Because as Brendan said, um, we've done very well with the over 70s, but we want more people because the job's not done. So the ad campaign will continue to evolve. I might ask uh, uh, JJ to make some comments on this because one of the things he's been looking at is the public communications. But we've got $40 million that's been, uh, uh, $41 million now that's been allocated. And that's a continuous program that's relevant to the relative stage of the vaccination program. But the okay. stage of the so, so will, it, sorry, um, will, will that then still be run by sort of um, bureaucrats and doctors, or will we see other people now getting involved in the encouragement process? Yeah, so I, I'm being uh, given responsibility for helping encourage Australians to get vaccinated as well. So we are coming through an information campaign period where we were informing those most at risk about how they could get vaccinated. We'll be now moving into encouraging those next cohorts to get vaccinated. Uh, and we will look at all of the best ways to do that. We will also be, as I said, when we review the plan, looking at ways we can accelerate vaccinations as additional supplies come online. And that will, uh, that will require us opening up as many possible pathways for vaccination as well. So the campaign will both be about encouraging people to get there and then telling people how they can uh, hopefully more readily get there. Minister, after the previous Atagi advice, a lot of the over 50s reportedly were, were waiting until they could get the Pfizer and telling the doctors that they wanted to wait until the Pfizer came on board. And at that point, you were encouraging them to go ahead and get the AstraZeneca vaccine. What's to stop people in the over 60 cohort now thinking this they wait, out, wait long enough, they too will be able to get access to the Pfizer. And just secondly, can I just confirm this is the first time Atagi has recommended lifting the, the level to the over 60s for AZ? Correct. Now, we received that advice, I think, at about 12.50 today and obviously called this conference immediately um, and have provided our response. Uh, in terms of uh, the messaging, the medical messaging has been right throughout. If you are in an eligible group, please do not wait. That couldn't be a simpler, clearer message. And I'll take the, uh, the very last question, Jono, and I apologise to, to others. Minister of Medics, could, could I ask you, how many deaths in Australia are under investigation by the TGA for people over the age of 60 relating to this vaccine? If those turn out to be linked to the vaccine, will that advice change? And you talk about the campaign relative to what's taking place at the moment. How do you address the hesitancy issue and try and actually get people to get vaccinated if the advice keeps changing a lot? Let me step back for a second. Around the world, uh, everybody is dealing with a situation which is different than anything we've seen for 100 years. Uh, the Australian situation, because we've taken the medical advice, uh, is vastly different, as I say. Over 2 million lives lost officially, yet none in Australia to anybody who's caught COVID in 2021. That juxtaposition, I think, is extraordinary. But that's because we followed the medical advice. And yes, sometimes it, it is difficult and challenging. But think of the alternative of not accepting the medical advice. That's not an alternative on my watch. That's not an alternative on the Prime Minister's watch, which we're willing to take. And so, you know, we are apologetic that uh, this is a difficult circumstance for every nation and a difficult circumstance for our nation. But the only thing to do is to follow that medical advice. The alternative um, would not be responsible. So that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing. In terms of uh, hesitancy and support, I think uh, I might have Paul and then Brendan, and then uh, we'll finish on that. 
So just so each week, um, right th right throughout since April, we've we've had weekly safety reports. In fact, from earlier than that, uh, from the TGA, uh, and so they do outline exactly and answer, answer that question. So it's available online now. Uh, but just to summarise, in the week of the 7 to 13 of June 2021, they received over 2,000 uh, events, uh, adverse events, following immunisation in relation to COVID vaccines. They investigate every single one of those. Uh, there was also 303 reports of death following vaccine. But it needs to be really clear that we've concentrated on that elderly age group, that things happen you know, throughout life. And, and so that does not mean because something happens after a vaccination that it's caused by the vaccination. But every single one of those deaths is, is being looked at. Uh, so far, apart from the two that we know about in relation to those clotting uh, issues, there's not been any deaths that have been directly associated with the vaccine. Uh, but they keep an open mind. They look at new things all the time. But that's, that's the reality at the moment. Uh, what I'll do is I'll finish here, but I'll just make this comment that uh, I want to thank Australians for coming forward, over 6.2 million vaccinations. There are challenges. This is uh, the biggest global peacetime challenge that I think any of us have known in, in our lives. And Australia continues, as, as we saw with the economic data that the Treasurer released before, uh, along with the fact that we've had no, no loss of life to anybody who's caught COVID in a world of 2 million cases to achieve things that virtually no other country is doing. But it isn't easy, and we do have to be resilient. Australians have been magnificent, um, and I want to thank them. Yes, it does mean that for those in the 50 to 59 group, uh, they have to be more patient uh, as they have been, but they have to be patient over the coming weeks. But equally, as has been raised, many who had wanted access to Pfizer will now have access to Pfizer. So. Um, there are always challenges, but there's a response, and as JJ has set out, there's a clear plan. We'll get through this, we'll get this done, and we'll continue to keep Australians safe. Take care, everybody.